Okay, chapter four, section five, absolute maxima and minima. <clears throat> so f of c is a local maximum if f of x is less than or equal to f of c for all x near c, and a local minimum if f of x is greater than or equal to f of c for x near c. In this section, we see the largest and the smallest value of f of x throughout the domain of f. So let me think of, or let me uh, put down a little picture to express this definition of a local maximum or local minimum. So for example, let's say that we have a graph that looks like this. Um, so, I want to let me do this, this question, this is number one. Okay, so we would say that um, a local maximum is going to be something that looks like, say, this point right here, um, and it's king of the hill near it. So, uh, if there exists a little neighborhood, if we think of tracing this back down, its input value. So let's say that there is a value c right here such that this point right here traces up to the value f of c. Right, so this is the ordered pair c comma f of c, like that. Uh, so we'd say that if there is a little neighborhood around c, so let's say that that little neighborhood is something like that, Let's highlight it so that there's a little subset of our domain of our function such that whenever you pick any x value near c, but not c necessarily, uh, well, it could be c, but any other value near c, right? That's what this means for x near c. Uh, so for example, if we let uh, um, x be this number right here, that's close to c, or maybe x could be this value over here, let's subscript them, there's x sub 1, maybe x sub 2, right, you can pick anything close to c, and no matter which value you choose, the output ends up being some uh, f of x value that's less than or equal to that f of c, right, so uh, f, uh, f of c is a local maximum if f of x is less than or equal to f of c for x near c. And then likewise, we can take that definition over here and think of some other value. So we would say this point over here is a local minimum. And again, we can trace it back. And let's put a little subscript. So instead, uh, let's call this, um, well, let's call this one C of naught. So it's a little bit different that one. But anyway, okay, so there's some C value here. And it's going to be the lowest value in a little neighborhood. So there will exist some little neighborhood around that c sub naught value, so that if you choose any other x value around there, uh, if we choose, for example, uh, an x here, and call that x sub 3, or call that x sub 4, right? any x value chosen near this value, it will turn out that uh, the output values will be greater than or equal to the value at c naught. Right, so let's trace this back. This is f of c naught. Okay. And so this is the point c sub naught comma f of c sub naught is this guy here. Good. And so any other x value you choose, say that one, traces from there, or maybe this one traces up to there. Right, so any other value you choose, it will turn out that in this little uh, section, any x value chosen near c, it will turn out that f of x is greater than or equal to f of c. Uh, therefore, therefore, defining this as a local, local minimum. Local minimum. And this one as a local maximum.
Okay, some definitions. <clears throat> if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain of f, then f of c is called the absolute maximum of f. Um, notice, for example, up here, let's come back up here, there's more than one local maximum in the way I drew it. There's a local maximum here, there's a little neighborhood around there, uh, but there's also another local maximum up there. There exists a little neighborhood that can be identified or traced back down. So this guy can come down. Doo -doo -doo. And then there's some C value here. We can create a little neighborhood around it. Right, That neighborhood could be small, uh, as small as small as it needs to be in order for this to work out. So we have a little neighborhood around there such that if we choose a C, let's call this C sub 1, um, uh, any other value chosen near C sub 1, it will turn out that F of C sub 1 will be greater than or equal to any other F of X value as long as X is chosen to be some value near C sub 1, thereby defining another local maximum. Right, so this would be C sub 1 comma F of C sub 1. It's another local maximum. There it is. And for any other X value chosen, x sub 5 or x sub 6, any other x value that's really close to this, it'll turn out that um, f of c sub 1 will be greater than or equal to any f of x value as long as x comes from that little uh, highlighted region. Okay, but now if we don't uh, think about a neighborhood around a value, we just think about the entire domain, then that's what this definition is referring to. If uh, it turns out that f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain of f, then f of c is called the absolute maximum. It's the highest value the function can achieve. Uh, in my little picture up here, then this value here is not just a local maximum. This one can be upgraded to be uh, an absolute max. this point right here is not just a local maximum, it's also the absolute maximum. It's the absolute uh, highest value, largest value output in the range of this function, right? There's no other uh, value in our function that's higher than this point. It's the maximum point. Uh, on the other hand, if f of c is less than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain of f, then f of, then if f of c is called the absolute minimum of f. An absolute maximum or absolute minimum is called an absolute, absolute extremum. Okay, some visual examples. So let's say f of x is equal to x to the power of 3 divided by 3 minus 4x. Okay, so here's our graph. Notice that um, this graph, maybe it's not super clear here, but these are little arrows here. So this is a little arrow goes that way, indicating that the function continues in that direction. And down here, there's a little arrow that goes this way, indicating the function goes that way. So if we're considering the entire domain of our function, then there is no absolute maximum because this will just keep going forever and ever and ever. And this keeps going down for and ever and ever. So there's no absolute minimum and no absolute maximum. However, we do have a local maximum and we do have a local minimum. Here at x equals to negative 2, we have a local maximum, right? So there's a little neighborhood following our definition. There's a little neighborhood around this value such that any other x value chosen in that neighborhood, so if we let x be this guy, x of 1, or maybe we let x be this guy, x of 2, no matter which x value we choose, they will all trace down to a value that's less than or equal to the value we get from plugging in a negative 2. So at this point, we're simply uh, stating that this is true based on the picture. Uh, in a second, we'll get into the mechanics as of, of how can we prove that based on the equation, right? How can I know by looking at this equation that this is going to happen? Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit, but for now, we're just looking at the picture. And based on the picture, I can tell that in this little highlighted neighborhood, 
This guy is king of the hill. It's the local maximum. Good. To get the actual value at that point, we can evaluate our function f of negative 2 equals to negative 2 to the power of 3 divided by 3 minus 4 times negative 2, which means gives me f of negative 2 equals to negative 8 divided by 3 plus 8, which means that f of negative 2 equals to negative 8 divided by 3 plus 24 divided by 3, which finally gives me 16 divided by 3. f of negative 2 equals to positive 16 thirds, which gives me that uh, maximum there as the point negative 2 comma 16 thirds. That's that local maximum. Local max. Okay, on the other hand, we also have a local minimum over here at x equals to positive 2. Again, at this point, don't worry about um, how to prove it based on the equation. We're just proof by picture at this point. Looking at the picture, I can tell that uh, positive 2 will result in a local minimum. Uh, again, thinking about the definition, it means that there exists a little neighborhood around uh, positive 2, like that, such that whenever I pick any other x value near 2, so maybe x sub 3 is that guy, or maybe x sub 4 is that guy, right? So it could be any x value in this little highlighted area. Uh, and it turns out that no matter which one I choose, they won't be quite as low as this one will be less than or equal to that one. Okay, so that establishes a local minimum here. Local minimum. Again, to plug in the actual value, you can do the same thing. It, to get the actual value of that local minimum, local minimum. Okay. To get the actual value, you just evaluate our function at 2. We're going to get a very similar response, uh, and we get our local minimum that way. Okay, so our local minimum is right here. Okay, so um, again, there's no absolute or uh, absolute maximum or absolute minimum for this function, but there is one local minimum and one local maximum. Here's another example. Let's say f of x equals to 4 minus x squared. We know that this is an upside down parabola shifted up. So here is the graph. And just from our knowledge of uh, parabolas, we know that the vertex is going to happen uh, right at this point. And so we know that that's going to be the local maximum, local max. Again, by the definition, we know that there is a little neighborhood around that input value, which we know to be tr uh, zero, right, just from our knowledge of parabolas and also by picture we can see that the input value is x uh, x equals to zero so right there right at the origin uh, the input value of the origin traces up to the tallest value so we have a local maximum to get the actual result to get the actual value of our function uh, we can just evaluate f of zero which would give me 4 minus 0 squared, or f of 0 equals to 4. So we know that that local maximum will occur at the point 0, comma, positive 4. Okay. By definition of local uh, maximums, we know that any other value of x in this little highlighted region here, x sub 1 could be there, x sub 2 could be there, right? Any x value chosen in this little highlighted region, uh, it will be true that f of 0 uh, f of 0 will be greater than or equal to any other f of x in that little region. That's how we establish a local maximum. But beyond the local maximum, we can also see that uh, these arrows point down, right? It's a parabola. It's going to go down in both directions. So not only is it a local maximum, it turns out to be an absolute maximum as well. We can also say that this is also also an absolute absolute max and it's the tallest one we don't have to restrict ourselves to this little domain x could be chosen anywhere in the domain all real numbers 
uh, and it would still be true that 4 is the largest value. f of 0 would be the, the largest value uh, observed. Okay. Notice that in this graph, however, there is no local minimums and there is no absolute minimums. Right? This graph just keeps going down forever and ever and ever, uh, and we do not have any uh, local minimum. Okay, so here's another example. Uh, so f of x equals to x to the power of two-thirds. Uh, so we can see that it comes down to a sharp point and then keeps going. So something funny is happening there at zero. If we try evaluating at zero, we get a valid result. So zero is in the domain of our function. So f of zero equals to zero to the two-thirds power. And remember, this means that this is the same as the cube root of 0 squared. 0 squared is 0, no problem there. And the cube root of 0 is fine, that's just 0. So we do get the ordered pair 0, 0. And it is a valid point in our graph, 0, 0. And from the picture, we could see that 0, 0 is a local minimum. So if we put a little... Okay, let me zoom into here a little more. Uh, if we create a little neighborhood around it like that, then we know that in that little neighborhood in there, any other x value you choose, like maybe that one or maybe that one, will always result in an output value that is greater than or equal to that one. Right, that one is the smallest one in that neighborhood. So uh, we know that f of 0 will be less than or equal to any other f of x in that neighborhood, thereby establishing that uh, 0 comma f of 0, which in this case is equal to 0 comma 0, is a local minimum. Local minimum. Okay, furthermore though, if we notice that these little arrows go that way forever and that way forever, uh, then we can also upgrade this point to be not just a local minimum, but it's also a absolute minimum. Okay, um, notice that it does come to a sharp point here. So that means the derivative does not exist there. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, when we have a, a graph where we have a sharp corner like this, we know that the derivative does not exist at that point. Okay, so we have an absolute local, uh, sorry, an absolute minimum, a local minimum. But this graph is an example of a graph that does not have any absolute maximums or local maximums. Theorem 1, the extreme value theorem. Theorem 1, extreme value theorem, says that a function f that is continuous on a closed interval from a to b has both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on that interval. Okay, so it, uh, you know, be careful with the definition. We're talking about functions that are continuous. It has to be a function that's continuous. Uh, that's really important because if it's not continuous, then weird things can occur. So, um, for example, if we have... If we have um, a section from A to B, A to B like this, so this is our little domain, the function can be doing all kinds of things outside of that region, but we're only interested in this region here. So maybe our graph is doing this over here, it could be broken over there, maybe it shoots off to infinity over here and comes back from over there like that, maybe there's a vertical asymptote over there. You know, who knows what the graph Who knows what the graph is doing outside of this little region, but all we care about is in this little segment from A to B. So let's say that my graph maybe comes down like this and goes like that. So it's continuous, at least in this little segment, it's continuous. So this is saying that no matter how you draw it, as long as you don't have weird jumps, 
no holes, no jumps, no vertical asymptotes, it's continuous, then you will observe a maximum and a minimum, an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum in that little section. Okay. Keep in mind that uh, it's possible that the absolute maximum and minimum could occur at the actual endpoints. The way I've drawn it here, it looks like maybe B is the absolute uh, minimum in this little segment, whereas uh, looks like the absolute maximum is like somewhere over there, so it's not exactly at A. Here's an example. So find the absolute extrema for this function. So we have f of x equals to x cubed minus 21x squared plus 135x minus 170 on the closed interval from 2 to 12. So let me zoom in here. So if we just focus on this segment, of the number line from 2 to 12, ignore everything else, then our function runs from here all the way out to there. Uh, and we can see that our absolute minimum will occur right there at x equals to 2. And our absolute maximum will occur right here at uh, x equals to 12. Now, if we just drew the whole thing, if we just ignored that little uh, subsection, this graph continues to go that way, and then this continues to go this way. So there is no absolute maximum or absolute minimum for the entire function, but if we restrict ourselves to just this little interval from 2 to 12, then there is uh, an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum, and in this case, it happens to occur at the endpoints, at the endpoints of our uh, subset, at 2 and at 12. Again, so far, we're just answering these questions based on the picture. We'll uh, deal with the equations in a little bit. Okay. Now, notice that if we have... So now notice that if we change the uh, interval to go from 4 to 10, so instead of 2 to 12, it goes from 4 to 10, we just change the interval, keep the same equation, then our answers will change a little bit. Now, um, the end point, the, the end point of our intervals map to this point here, and this one maps to that point there perhaps to that one and that one. Uh, and now neither one of the endpoints represent the maximum or minimums. So now the absolute maximum is observed to be at uh, f of 5, which is equal to 105, and at f of 9, which is equal to 73. Again, don't worry about how we found those values yet. We're just doing proof by picture. So we can see that now this becomes the new absolute maximum in this little restricted domain, and this becomes the new absolute minimum in this restricted domain. Right? It's kind of like you're trying to find the tallest kid and the shortest kid in school. Like, okay, the entire school, who's the tallest one in, I don't know, this is like... Uh, let's stick to like a high school. You go to a high school and you're like, okay, who's the tallest kid? Who's the shortest kid? Uh, and you find them. And then you go, okay, well, let's restrict it down to one classroom. Who's the tallest kid? Who's the shortest kid in this classroom? Well, the answer might change, right? So the domain uh, of where you're looking uh, has a big impact on what the answer is going to be. Okay. Um. On the other hand, now, if we restrict it even further and go from 4 to 8 instead, exactly the same graph. So now let's highlight the graph right here. So this time around, um, the right endpoint does end up being one of the uh, values. So at 8, we do experience 
um, the absolute minimum. Uh, but the left endpoint at four is still not the absolute maximum. The absolute maximum is still experienced to be there at five. So the point we're driving at is that sometimes the endpoints end up being the absolute maximums or minimums. Sometimes they are not the absolute maximums and both of them are found somewhere in the middle. And sometimes it could be a combination where one of the apps, uh, extremum is found in the center of our interval, somewhere in the middle, and the other uh, extremum might be one of the endpoints. So it's a combination of, of uh, results. Okay, so again, we're sticking with the same uh, equation. And so now on the closed interval from 3 to 11, so here we have a case where 3 maps to that number, uh, but so does this number. So here we have a case where we have a tie. There are two values in that interval that tie to be absolute minimums. And then there are two values in that interval, this one and this one, that tie to be absolute maximums. And in this little case, the uh, endpoints end up being uh, interesting values in both cases. So we have the endpoints are the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum, but also there's another, there's two other internal points that are also absolute maximums and absolute minimums. So uh, hopefully this example is driving at the fact that the uh, actual interval makes a big difference in what our answers are going to be. So you have to be, re you know, you have to pay attention. It's not just about the equation. You have to pay attention to the interval that we're interested in. And you have to check uh, the endpoints as well as the values in between. And you can have any combination of including getting results from the endpoints as our answer. Uh, you know, when you're looking for the absolute extrema, the answer could be the endpoints or it could be a value in between or any combination of those. Okay, so theorem two, locating absolute extrema. So, so far we've been doing proof by picture. You have the graph and you can do it um, by looking at the graph. Uh, so we're gonna start thinking about how do we find them using equa you know, our equations? How do we prove they're there? Or how do we find them using our equations? So one of those, is, you know, in, on our way to finding them, this theorem will help us. So theorem two, locating absolute extrema, absolute extrema, uh, if they exist, must occur at critical numbers or at the endpoints. Okay. So uh, in order to find our uh, local extrema, we need to find the critical numbers and test those values as well as the endpoints. So here's a procedure that we're gonna apply for finding uh, absolute extrema on a closed interval. So check to make certain that F is continuous over uh, uh, the interval from A to B. Remember that if the function is not continuous, all this goes out the window. If we have some sort of weird break, if it's allowed to jump to infinity, um, then this, this uh, whole situation goes out the window. We have to make sure that's true. Step two, find the critical numbers on the interval from A to B. Step three, evaluate F at the endpoints A and B and at the critical numbers found in step two. Step four, the absolute maximum of F on A, B is the largest value found in step three. Step five, the absolute minimum of F on A, B is the smallest value found in step three. Okay, so here's an example. Find the absolute maximum uh, and absolute minimum of uh, this function. So f of x equals to x cubed minus 6x squared on the interval from negative 7 to 7. Okay, step one, continuous. Step one, we know that f of x is a polynomial. f of x is a polynomial. Um, and so we know it's continuous. All polynomials are continuous. All polynomials are continuous. On all 
real numbers from negative infinity to infinity. So if f of x is continuous on all real numbers, numbers certainly it's continuous on the interval from negative 7 to 7. Thus, f of x is continuous on the interval from negative 7 to 7. No problem. OK, step two, we've got to find the critical values. So for step two, uh, we've got to take a derivative. So f prime of x, so this is going to be easy. It's just an easy polynomial. This will be 3x squared minus 12x. And now to find critical numbers, we have to figure out when this equals to 0 or when it's undefined. Well, it's a polynomial, so it's never going to be undefined. We just said um, that all polynomials are continuous everywhere. So there's no place where it's undefined, but we can figure out when it equals to 0. So let's let 0 equal to 3x squared minus 12x. So 0 equals to... Um, 0 equals to 3x, factoring out a 3 and an x, we get an x minus 4. And so uh, 3x equals to 0 is one answer, so x equals to 0 is one answer. Or x minus 4 equals to 0, therefore x equals to 4 is another answer. Okay, so these are the two places where the derivative will be equal to 0. These are partition points of the uh, first derivative. And now if we go back and double check our interval, 0 and 4 are both inside this interval, and the function is continuous at that point, uh, at those two points. So we can upgrade both of them to say that they're both critical numbers. So both x equals to 0 and x equal to 4 are critical numbers. OK, now for step 3. Step three, uh, we got to create a table of values. So we're going to check uh, the following. So we can create a little table. And we're going to evaluate our original function, not the derivative. So we're going to have f of x equals to x cubed minus 6x squared. And we're going to test the critical numbers that we just found, critical number, critical number. But we also have to test the endpoints. Right. Endpoints and the critical numbers get evaluated. So x here. So let's say, for example, starting from the left, we're going to have negative 7. So we'll have blank cubed minus 6 times blank squared. Negative 7, negative 7. So we've got to figure out what that is. We'll use our calculator in a second. Uh, next, we have to think about uh, 0. So 0 in there. And so we'll have blank cubed minus 6 times blank squared. Put zeros in there. Well, this one's easy. 0 cubed minus 6 times 0. The whole thing is just going to be 0. So we'll have the ordered pair 0, comma 0 there. And then we have to test 4 and 7 as the last two values to test on this table here. So 4 and 7. Blank cubed minus 6 times blank squared equals and blank cubed minus 6 times blank squared equals equals. Okay, so this is a great place to use our calculator. Awesome. Okay, so go over to y equals, type in our equation. Remember, it's the original function, not the derivative. So, so go to y equals, type in um, x to the power of 3, x to the power of 3, and then minus 6x power of 2, enter. Make sure plot 1, plot 2, and plot 3 are all off. If you don't know how to turn them off, then go up and highlight and then hit enter. And then go down. See how that box is darker? That means we've just activated plot 1. We don't want that. So make sure you come up here and you hit enter and you walk away from it. There we go. 
Make sure nothing else is also uh, here. So you can either clear delete any other equation uh, to, to, uh, to get rid of them, or see how this equal sign is darker. That means that this is the equation that's active. Uh, if we have another equation, like let's say we have that guy there minus, um, you know, oops. We have another equation here like 8x um, e to the, I don't know, whatever, third, whatever, some other equation here. Uh, and we don't want to de delete it. We can always use our arrows to go over the equal sign, hit enter, and see how that equal sign is no longer dark. It means that it's not active, so it won't, uh, it won't, they won't mess with our calculations. This is the only one that's active. Okay, so that's what we want. Next, we want to go to table set, second shift table set. Uh, make sure you put independent variable to ask, uh, to ask, and dependent variable to auto. These two don't matter. Okay, so if they're not like that, use your arrows. Go over there, select them. Make sure independent is under ask, and dependent is under auto. Next, we're going to go over, it says table, so second, table, and whatever's on there, just hit delete, 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 get rid of whatever's on there. Okay, so this is a place where the calculator will evaluate these results. So for example, we already have the zero, so if we put a zero in here, it should calculate a zero. And if we calculate a negative seven, it automatically does this for us, negative seven cubed minus six times negative seven squared, and so we get negative 637. Uh, just to have them in order, I'm gonna put these guys in again. Delete, delete, and start with negative seven first, then the zero, then the four, then the seven. Okay, so these numbers weren't too, too bad. This equation wasn't too bad. You probably could have done it without this whole process, but as we run into equations that are more ugly and we have a longer list of critical numbers that are also ugly, uh, it becomes more beneficial to, to go through the trouble of creating this process so that you can find your answers. And so let me just copy these down. Negative Okay, so negative 637, 0, negative 32, and 49, giving us the ordered pairs negative 7, comma, negative 637, 0, comma, 0, uh, 4, comma, negative 32, and 7, comma, 49. Okay, so then the final steps, steps, um, what are we in, 4? Step four and step five is just going to be identify which one of these values is the largest value, which one's the smallest value. Uh, this one then becomes our absolute minimum. Absolute min, because it's the smallest value at negative 637, the smallest output. And the largest output is this one. So this becomes our absolute max. So this is a situation where the endpoints are the ones that ended up determining the absolute minimum and the absolute maximum. Okay, so this is the process for finding the absolute extrema of a given function. Uh, first, establish uh, that that function is continuous on the given interval. Next, you're going to find that first derivative and find the critical numbers. Remember, to find those, we either set the first derivative equal to zero, or we figure out when that first derivative is undefined. Those will be our partition points of the first derivative. Then we uh, compare those values to the interval uh, that we're interested in and make sure those values are in that interval. So then uh, we can upgrade some of those values to be critical numbers. And next, we've got to create this table so that we can figure out the outputs of our function at all the critical numbers plus the endpoints. Don't forget the endpoints. And then from there, we just have to figure out which one is the largest one. That's our absolute max, the largest output. 
and which one is the smallest output, that'll be our absolute minimum. So second derivative and extrema example. So f the first derivative evaluated at c equals to 0 and the second derivative being greater than 0, meaning that it is positive, implies that f of c is a local minimum, right? So we know that when the second derivative is positive, right, that's what this notation here means, second derivative strictly greater than 0, is another way of saying that the second derivative is positive. Second derivative is positive. So we know that when the second derivative is positive, it means that the, the underlying first derivative is increasing. First derivative is increasing. And we know that when the first derivative is increasing, it means that the underlying function is concave up. f of x is concave up. Right. So second derivative is positive, first derivative is increasing, that means that the original function is concave up. It has this sort of a shape. And so we know that this must be the lowest point. Okay, And that happens when that first derivative is equal to 0. Right, The slope of the line tangent at that point is going to be horizontal. So we know that that first derivative evaluated at c will be equal to 0. So f prime, um, the first derivative evaluated at c equals to 0 means we have a horizontal tangent. And the second derivative is strictly greater than zero implies that f of c is a local minimum. Okay, on the other hand, if this was our graph, it looked like this. Uh, so we'd have, um, so let's focus on this part here. So the second derivative is less than zero. Just like before, the second derivative is less than zero is another way of saying that the second derivative is positive, I'm oh, sorry, negative, the second, second derivative of f is uh, negative, negative. We know that when the second derivative is negative, it means that the first derivative is decreasing which implies that the underlying function f of x is concave down right it's a sad function like this therefore we know that this point right there is a maximum good so uh, at that point, we have a horizontal uh, tangent line like this, which means the derivative, the first derivative equals to zero. And so if we know that the first derivative evaluated at c equals to zero, and we know that the second derivative is less than zero, it's negative, we can combine those two to recognize that that must mean that there's a local maximum at that point. Okay, so um, both of these two things, if we can establish both of these two things to be true, then we can figure out that that point is a local maximum. Okay, so all that results in the, um, <clears throat> the second derivative test for local extrema. So let C be a critical number of F such that F prime of C equals to zero. If the second derivative F prime of C is greater than zero, then F of C is a local minimum. If the second derivative is less than zero, then F of C is a local maximum. Okay, so there's a little table of you know possible outputs so f prime of c equals to zero right and also f prime of c is i'm oh, sorry the second derivative evaluated at c is positive so the combination of those two means that it's concave upward which means that we have a local uh, minimum so it'll look something like this concave upward remember it's like a little happy face so um the value the the place where our first derivative will be zero will mean that the tangent line will be horizontal. 
So we'll have a tangent line right there. That's where the tangent line is horizontal. So we'll have something that looks like that. Something that looks kind of like that. And so we'll have a local minimum. On the other hand, if the first derivative is zero, the second derivative is negative, then we have conca concave upward. Okay, so then um, second derivative is negative, we have concave downward, which means we have a local maximum. So we have something that looks like this. Very importantly, if the first derivative is zero and the second derivative is also zero, then we don't really have a conclusion, right? This test doesn't apply. It could be one of several things. So more information would need to be determined at that point. So this little test here wouldn't give you a conclusive answer when this happens. So it's only valid when the first derivative is zero. Um, and the second derivative at that point is either positive, a positive number, or a negative one. So that's kind of wrapped up in this. Theorem 3, the second derivative test for absolute extrema on an open interval. So let f be, continue, be continuous on an interval i with only one critical number c in i. So if f prime of c equals to zero and uh, the second derivative value at c is strictly greater than zero, then f of c is the absolute minimum on the interval f on i. So nothing new here. I'm just being repetitive. We've, uh, we're doing the exact same thing. So we're combining two things. The first, the value c um, is, uh, is, is one such that the first derivative at c equals to zero and the second derivative at c is strictly greater than zero. So it's positive, some positive number. And the posit second derivative is positive means we're concave up. So there will be a minimum there. Good, an absolute minimum at that point. Uh, so the point there will be that the c is somewhere in this interval i, if you're wondering where's the c. There'll be some c in the little interval i uh, so we're restricting our interval i to be small enough to where there's only one critical number there. There's only one value where the first derivative equals to zero. Good. Okay. Um, uh, likewise, if the first derivative value at c equals to zero and the second derivative value at c is negative, remember, second derivative is negative, mean that the function is concave down. And so we'll have one value in there like this. So that will be our local, oh, sorry, our absolute maximum. All right, let's look at an example. Okay, um, so find the absolute extremum of this function on the interval from zero to infinity, um, not including zero. And so I can see that this is going to be a function that's continuous on this interval, right? So the only place where we can get into trouble is if we let x equal to 0, right? That's the only place where we could be dividing by 0. So note, note um, f of 0 is a undefined, right? Because we're going to be dividing by 0. But that's okay because 0 is not in the domain, right? This is strictly greater than 0, so we're okay. So f of x is continuous on the interval from 0 to infinity. Okay, so let's find our first derivative. f prime of x is going to be equal to the derivative with respect to x of x plus, and I'm going to rewrite this as x to the negative 1 power like that. And so we know that the first derivative is going to be equal to 1 minus 4x to the minus 2 power, which then equals to 1 minus 4 over x squared. And if we wanted to combine these two, we can multiply this one by an x squared over an x squared. Know that this is going to end up being x squared minus 4 over x squared. Okay, so that's the uh, best we got for the, the, the first derivative. And now if we want to do the second derivative, f double prime of x will be equal to the derivative of the first derivative, which will be 1 minus 4x to the minus 2 power. So that's going to be a 0 from there. That's easy. f of x equals to that. And for the next one, it will be minus, so it will be 0 minus 4 minus 2x to the minus 3 power. 
means that the second derivative uh, is equal to positive 8, so 8x to the minus 3, or just 8 over x to the third power. Okay, so now let's find the critical numbers. So when will this function equal to 0, or when is it undefined? So um, f prime of x equals to 0. Let's start there. Uh, to do that, we're going to set our function equal to 0. So that means x squared minus 4 over x squared equals to 0. Well, this will occur, this will happen whenever the numerator is 0. So this is true when x squared minus 4 equals to 0. And at the same time, the denominator does not equal to 0. So we'll just double check that that's true. Uh, well, this one's going to be easy uh, since it's just 0. But OK, so we can say that x squared, now let's do it the other way around. So we can factor this easily into x minus, minus 2 x plus 2 equals to 0. And so x minus 2 equals to 0, which is going to be that x equals to 2 is one solution. And x plus 2 equals to 0, which means x equals to negative 2 is another solution. Uh, and likewise, we could have said, or I could have said x squared minus 4 equals to 0, x squared equals to 4. So x equals to plus or minus root 4, or x equals to plus or minus 2. Right, either path x equals to plus or minus 2. Either path would reach the same conclusion that x equals to 2 and x equals to negative 2 are two partition points of the first derivative. And also, um, going back to making sure we find the complete list, uh, we also have to think about when is this function, uh, when does it not exist? So note f prime of x equals does not exist when the denominator equals to 0. So when x squared equals to 0, which means x equals to 0 is the other place. OK, so we have three partition points. Partition points are x equals to 0, x equals to 2, x equals to negative 2. But when we go back and think about our domain, we're interested in just the segment from 0 to infinity. And the only number in that uh, from that list that's in here is the number 2. So 2 is the only critical number of interest. So we have um, from, from 0 to infinity, here's 0. And we have that positive 2 is in here. But negative 2 is over here somewhere. And 0 is not in the domain. So neg uh, positive 2 is the only critical number. x equals to 2 is the only critical number. OK, now let's think about the second derivative. The second derivative is equal to this. OK, um, so 8 over x cubed. And for the domain of interest, we're only interested in positive numbers, right? We're never going to consider a negative one. So if we think of any positive number being cubed, we're going to get another positive number. And 8 divided by a positive number is going to be a positive number. So I can see by looking at uh, the second derivative that f double prime of x is always positive um, on the interval from 0 to infinity. Okay. In particular, we're interested in the number 2. So note, let's, let's bring it all together here. So note that f prime of 2, we've established that that's equal to 0. And also, f double prime of 2, well, that's just going to be equal to 8 divided by 2 cubed, which equals 1. But more importantly, it's greater than 0. So f double prime of 2 is positive. So we have everything we need. Uh, x equals to 2 is a critical number. x equals to 2 
is a critical number. And we can evaluate our function at 2, f of 2 equals to 2 plus 4 divided by 2, which gives me 4. So we have the order pair 2 comma 4. And we know that the first derivative is 0, and we know that the second derivative is positive. When uh, the second derivative is positive, we know that the underlying function is going to have like a happy face. Right? Positive means that it's going to have some sort of a shape like that, concave up. <clears throat> so we just established that this point will represent a, a absolute minimum. Okay, so that, that'll be our steps. Um, think about our function, figure out, make sure that it's continuous on the interval that we're interested in. Uh, find the first derivative, find the second derivative, find the critical numbers associated with the first derivative. Um, make sure we compare them against our uh, given number line to make sure that they really are critical numbers. Then figure out what's happening with the second derivative, whether it's positive or negative. Really, at this point, we only care whether it's positive or negative, the second derivative. Uh, so sometimes that's useful. You don't actually have to calculate it. You just have to establish whether it's positive or negative. And that'll help us establish whether we have a um, absolute minimum or absolute maximum at the given point. Okay, let's see what the author did. So equation, okay, so derivative, same thing. Critical numbers are this one and this one. The only critical number on the interval is x equals to 2. When we evaluate the second derivative at 2, we got that it was a 1, which is positive. Uh, f of 2 leads to 4, so that's an absolute minimum um, on 0 to infinity. And notice that our function has no, uh, no absolute maximums on this interval. Okay, so hopefully that's enough to tackle your homework. Uh, as usual, come to my office hours if you have any questions.